I couldn't, truly couldn't imagine a more interesting and better guest than Galen Buckwalter. Galen was the inventor of the matching algorithm at eHarmony, the dating site, which was the very first dating site in the world using a, an algorithm to match people. He's today the chief science, science officer at SciML, and we'll talk a whole bunch about SciML today, where he's using psychological assessments to bring um, uh, machine learning and robotics into the, the truly the human uh, realm. Galen, I'm so stoked to have you here. Oh, um, pleasure. You've spent like literally a whole career on like trying to figure out like how people how people tick, right? Um, and you've done this at eHarmony, and we'll talk a little bit about the dating space a little later. But what are this is concept of psychometrics, right. which is really like your life's work, right? Absolutely. Like what are psychometrics and, and how do we use them in, yeah. in a technology sense? Yeah, psychometrics literally is um, the process of applying numbers to human behaviors. So when we know that as people we have um, traits like intelligence, um, like openness, like we have emotions, all of these um, exist, but if we want to study them, we have to be able to measure them. Um, the process of quantifying um, these latent traits is a very kind of arduous and systematic process. Um, but basically it boils down to you hypothesize something that exists, then you collect evidence of how it um, exists with internally with the measurements, the items that you're using, and then how it relates to other constructs that you hypothesize. So ultimately you get to a position where, you know, you say it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, you, you know, you have right. anger, you yeah. have um, openness. Uh, yeah or some personality trait. So that's um, the process of psychometrics. Applying it online has, to me, always seemed like a, a gift to psychologists because um, online, you know, we're able to, for the first time, apply psychometrics at scale. Um, the, the biggest problem in academic research around human traits has been simply that, you know, you look at, at studies of even 20 years ago, you were, you were surprised if you saw an N of 200 subjects. And that probably took the, the poor um, dissertation student, yeah. you know, a couple of years to collect. But now um, with the, the internet, with crowdsourcing sites like Mechanical Turk, we're able to get thousands of people to take questionnaires overnight, uh, which has sped up the pace of, of uh, personality and uh, emotion research just, just exponentially. So it's really exciting time to... Interesting. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Like, so when we measure, particularly a concept like personality, um, in your view, and I think this is the age-old question, is like, how much of personality is is stuck? Is like, you know, it is who we are, and it will pretty much always be who we are. Right. And how much of it is a fluid concept which changes pretty dynamically in terms of like, you know, my evolution as a as a as a being. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a great question, and it's one we're still figuring out. Um, there, there are clearly dimensions that, that change minimally across the lifespan. Um, but, but there's always change, um, you know, particularly around periods of, of great kind of relationship and social change. So, you know, we see 
major personality shifts like around the, the time when um, when young people go to college, uh, you know, a great increase in openness and, uh, you know, kind of ex exploration behaviors. Um, you also see changes around the time uh, that people get into long-term relationships. Um, so you, you probably see a common theme there that personality changes most in response to relationships, um, which tells you a lot about our brain, I think, yeah. you know, that, um, you know, our, our brain, our personality, I think, you know, it forms, um, you know, fairly early on by, you know, seven or eight. Um, it, it also forms around six dimensions that we've only recently really nailed down. It's the hexachrome uh, model, That's right? the hexachrome model. It's, can you explain we, this a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, over the, the generations, there's been, you know, psychologists have always, you know, had theories about personality. You know, Freud had the theory of, um, you know, subconscious and um, the unconscious. Um, you know, Jung had the archetypes. Um, and then there was also a very empirical uh, aspect of psychology that looked at, at personality in using uh, advanced analytics, primarily factor analysis. Um, interestingly, in the late 80s, early 90s, both of those converged into uh, what was initially called the ocean model or the five-factor model, which was openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, in, in really the past five to ten years, a uh, sixth dimension has been added, um, honesty, um, and additionally, um, you know, we've, we've shifted from using the somewhat pejorative term neuroticism to calling that dimension emotionality. Gotcha. Um, so now we have these six dimensions which really for the first time give us a rock solid understanding of personality. I mean this exists everywhere. Every culture, you know, both genders, um, it, it, it it's really solid. It gives us something to start to look at, you know, how much we change over the course of lifespan. Um, again, it, you know, we, we see subtle movements in these, um, but, but by and large, um, you know, the, the general structure of our personality stays the same. So, you know, in terms of online applications, that's where at SciML we're, we're really excited to not just measure people um, for academic, you know, research purposes, but to use that in applied settings. Um, you know, uh, my partner, uh, Dave Herman, and I had worked at uh, financial services company called Payoff uh, before we started SciML. And there, um, you know, we, we were able to uh, understand how much credit risk was related to personality wow. factors that you can just use the hexaco and... It's and also a little scary, right? It, it, um, I, I, in the I, shoes of like the, yeah, the, it, the person it, applying it, for credit, for if, example. If handled in the wrong way, I think I think it could be. Yeah. Um, what what we our approach is is that um, we only use it in the context of, of self insight. So we're not going to be using this um, in a way that people don't understand. Um, and we also think that in the context of self-insight, um, 
people are able to then start taking control of their personality. They understand it. They, they can um, better understand why they have problems with credit. Um, and then they can you know, work kind of in conjunction with their personality to do what it takes for them. Um, that's that's um, a very critical point about uh, applying this research is, um, you know, for, for CIML, we, we envision our AI um, to ultimately be empathy engines. That, um, you know, we know uh, a lot of, you know, what, what's good about humanity. We know that gratitude is, is hugely powerful and hugely beneficial to our very brain. So if we can start using, you know, this, this information and helping using machines to help us understand and, and um, advance our own empathy abilities, our own ability to be grateful, that, that's when it seems like it's a very positive thing. Yeah. And um, you're applying this also to robotics, right? The plan is to like make robots more human? Very much. Um, you know, we think like right now, um, you know, we're, we're using it to, um, you know, just to, uh, one instance that we're using uh, this technology is with uh, uh, people who have abused drugs and are trying to stay off of them. Yeah. So we have a bot that our, um, our brilliant developers, uh, Grace G and Eugene Wang, shout out, um, <laughs> that, um, that they have um, develop these uh, AI systems uh, that are capable of interacting with people that are experiencing, um, you know, desires to use drugs in a very empathetic, understanding way. Um, they, uh, in addition to understanding personality, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into understanding emotion, which is our, our short-term mood state. Yeah. So, you know, it, no matter what our personality is, you know, if something really bad happens, we're going to be sad or we're going to be angry. And, and that's going to influence everyone, how they, how they react. So we want to be able to understand someone's long-term, you know, characteristics, their yeah. personality. But then we, we react in the moment also based on their emotions. So, you know, we, with the um, drug abuse prevention program, we check in every morning with the people um, to get a read on, you know, whether they're they're feeling angry or happy, um, what their energy level is, um, because sometimes with, with drug abuse, if you're feeling really high yeah. and good, right, that, that's a, a risk. So um, based on all that information, then we react, you know, we give people exercises to do, basic cognitive behavioral therapy approaches, um, but throughout all of this, the machines learn. Yeah. Um, so we think, you know, that given, given the machine, this understanding of us, this understanding of people as growing um, through self-understanding, through under empathy towards others, um, that that puts a very different light on AI. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think, you know, if, if Elon Musk was thinking about AI yeah. in this context, 
would he be afraid of it? Right. Um, well, so I also can totally see the applications if we're thinking about uh, particular machines in the form of physical machines, robots becoming much more embedded in our lives. Mm -hmm. We want them to be, likely we want them, not all of them, right? Like yeah. a cooking robot doesn't need to be empathetic, I guess. Right. Probably he needs to because if I feel down, he should cook me or, you know, it should cook yeah. me comfort food, yeah. right? Right. Um, but I can totally see the implication. I'm really excited about your work. Um, before I have my last question for you for this interview, where can people learn more about your work, PsychML? How can they probably get involved? Yeah, um, we, our site is at uh, psyml.co, dot co. Um, we're developing that uh, quite, quite rapidly now, so you'll start to see that. Uh, I have a Medium uh, page at, uh, at Gail and Buckwalter. You can look, look up That's what awesome. we're writing there. Okay, so psyml.co and then check out Medium. My very last question, and I'm sorry we have to go there because yeah. you brought the world eHarmony. Uh -huh. um, with uh, online dating has, has gone through so many iterations, right? We had eHarmony and then we had Match and uh, then we had like Plenty of Fish and now we've got Tinder. And yeah. Do you think it's today the way to actually find your spouse? And like full disclosure, I found my spouse the old way and I'm very, very happily married to like the most amazing woman on the planet. Um, but do you think, like on average, like the the machines are better to find our perfect match than than uh, you know, like the the, the old-fashioned yeah. way? Yeah. Well, there is some data starting to to show up. Uh, there was a large-scale study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science uh, just about two years ago, I think, um, that looked at eHarmony, they looked at Match, they looked at, um, you know, your, your method of uh, <laughs> dating in the wild, as we call it. Yeah. Um, but what they found was that eHarmony, the divorce rate, was significantly lower than Match, but Match was also significantly lower than the wild. So it seems like, you know, just the process of looking at your potential partners in uh, a more, you know, kind of systematic way. I mean, marriage is not, um, I mean, marriage requires the passion and, and the, uh, you know, kind of the chemistry. Yeah. Um, but if you rely on that, that is not a good start for marriage. And I think, right. I think in the wild, that's a temptation. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think there can be advantages to a more systematic exploration that online dating uh, kind of enhances. Okay, now I have to ask you a very last cheeky question. Yeah. Where did you meet your wife? Uh, the old fashioned way, uh, in, in a class I was teaching. Fantastic, I love it. So all of you guys, get out there, find your match. If you don't find your match out there, use apps and definitely, definitely keep an eye on SciML and Galen's incredible work. Um, I, I truly believe your work will influence and change the way we think about machines interacting with us, uh, making them truly more human.